All right, so now we're going to talk about a punctuation problem, specifically with commas and semicolons. If you have ever wondered when to use a comma or a semicolon, then you are in the right place. So we'll start off with commas. You use a comma in between two independent clauses that are joined by a coordinating conjunction. Those are your fanboys. For instance, Harvey was a great man, comma, and Leslie was an amazing woman. What is a fanboy, you ask? Well, fanboys are the coordinated conjunctions. They're words that connect two complete sentences together. And fanboys is a mnemonic device, like the F means for, the A means and, N is nor, B is but, O is or, Y is yet, and S is so. If you have a fanboy in the middle of your sentence and you have a complete sentence on the left and a complete sentence on the right, then you need to use a comma. You also use commas when you are separating items in a series. For instance, you need nuts, bolts, and screws. Now, you may have heard that the comma before the and in a series is not necessary, right? It's called the Oxford comma, and some people tell you, oh, you don't need it anymore. Here's why I think you should use it. Take a look at this sentence. My greatest heroes are my parents, comma, Oprah Winfrey and Bill Clinton. I didn't realize that your parents were Oprah and Bill Clinton. I didn't know that that had happened. I think what you meant was, my greatest heroes are my parents, comma, Oprah Winfrey, comma, and Bill Clinton. That's three separate entities. So you want to make sure that you're using that comma be before and in order to make that distinction. Now, you also use commas after introductory phrases of more than two words, like by four in the afternoon, traffic is scary on the bridges. Now, this rule's a little sketchy, right? It's negotiable. Because when the introductory phrase is brief and starts with a preposition, um, you, you don't have to use it unless you want to. For instance, in 1798, the French had a revolution. Do you need the comma? Well, how do you tell? Would you pause if you were reading the sentence out loud? If you would pause, if you would say, in 1798, the French had a revolution, then you want to add the comma. And just as a reminder, prepositions, those are words like in and of, by, to, under, over, at, with. They usually tell you where something is in relation to something else. Um, it might be helpful to think of prepositions as they relate to a box. Like you could be in the box or on the box or near the box. Prepositions are also those words like during and um, with that tell you a little bit about time. But usually for our purposes, think of the box and that'll get you most of your prepositions. Another use for commas, they separate dependent clauses at the start of sentences from the independent clause, like because her alarm clock was broken, comma, she overslept and missed the bus. Now, quick note, a dependent clause is a group of words that doesn't make a complete sentence. Usually, it will start with the words like because or until or after or since or when or if. If it's at the beginning of the sentence, you need to use a comma before your subject. Like, after the accident happened, comma, Sandy was never the same. If your dependent clause is at the end of the sentence, then you do not need the comma. Like, Sandy was never quite the same after the accident happened. So, if you have your after right here in the middle of the sentence, then you don't put a comma between it. If your after is at the beginning, then you do need the comma. So that's how you deal with that comma issue. In addition, commas are used to set off transitional expressions, and they're also used for parentheticals. Those are things like for example and by the way. If it's extra information, you probably want to put some commas before and after it. When I use this word set off here, that means you put a comma before and a comma after. So it's like setting it off, literally. You could like cross it out and the sentence would still mean the same thing. Uh, from the, You're setting it off from the rest of the sentence. So, Moving on, now this is where it gets tricky. Um, commas are used to set off a positive. And a positive is a fancy name for those phrases which rename a noun or a pronoun. Like Judy, our new pitcher, was late to the playoff game. I don't need to know that Judy is our new pitcher in order to understand that someone named Judy was late to the game. Right, so our new pitcher is not really necessary, so I can put commas on either side of it. Now, that's different when you have a one word, a positive. If it's essential to the meaning of the sentence, then you do not put commas. For instance, the poet Shelley wrote Ode to the West Wind. The poet's wife, Mary, wrote Frankenstein. If I put commas around Shelley here, then I have the poet wrote Ode to the West Wind, and that's really vague. I have no idea what, which poet you're talking about. I would have to Google. Well, I guess it's not that hard to just Google it, but um, the idea here is that the sentence doesn't mean the same thing, whereas the point of the second sentence is that it was the poet's wife who wrote Frankenstein. I don't need to know that her name is Mary in order to understand that she is his wife. So this would be non-essential information. Now. 
how to spot the appositive. Appositives can be interchangeable. In other words, you can switch them around with the thing that is being renamed. For example, if you say Robert Caudry created the table alphabetical, which is the earliest English dictionary in 1604, or you could say Robert Caudry created the earliest English dictionary, the table alphabetical, in 1604. So these two things, right, earliest English dictionary and table alphabetical, those are interchangeable. They are both naming the same thing, so those are appositives. And you can literally flip them. That's how you tell. So if you have an appositive, you uh, put some commas around it in the middle of your sentence. Now this is the same rule, but in a slightly different situation. Commas are used with what are called non-restrictive relative clauses. That's a really fancy way of saying information that is not necessary to the meaning of the sentence. Usually these are sentences that start with who, which, or that, but there are others. So look at our example here. You have Raj, who is a part-time aviator, loves to tinker with machines of all kinds. Okay, do I need to know that Raj flies part-time in order to understand the point of the sentence, which is Raj loves to tinker with machines? So this part right here, this who is a part-time aviator, is not necessary. So essentially, I could cross it out and the sentence would still mean the same thing. If you could cross something out, that then you could also put commas around it. Put commas before and after and you maintain the meaning of the sentence. So here's the rule again, right? A non-restrictive or non-essential clause is a group of words that's not critical to the meaning of the sentence. You could just cross it out and the sentence's meaning won't change. For instance, Margie, my next door neighbor, bakes the most delicious cakes. Margie bakes the most delicious cakes. I don't need to know that she lives next door to me in order to get the idea that she's a great baker. So those are commas with non-restrictive relative clauses. And this is the other half of that same rule. So same thing if you have a who, which, or a that, and it's necessary to the meaning of the sentence, then don't put any commas around it. Let's look at this example. People who do their work efficiently make good students. Well, if I take out this phrase, right, this uh, or clause, um, who do their work efficiently, then what I'm left with is people make good students. And that is not the same thing, right? I've changed what the meaning of the sentence is, so I don't put commas around it. So here's where it says that, right? Removing it would change what the sentence says. So if you say something like drivers who text while driving are dangerous on the road, that's very different than drivers are dangerous on the road. Those are two separate thoughts. So I don't put commas here before the who or after the, the driving because that is essential information to the meaning of the sentence. Honestly, if you can wrap your head around those rules, the ones that we've covered so far, most of your comma woes will disappear. The rest are pretty basic. Um, we move into the elements of an address. You guys know how to do this, right? You put a comma between the street and the city, the city and the uh, state, but not between the state and the zip code. Um, that's a weird, quirky comic th comma thing that people argue about why that is, so I can't tell you right now. Um, you put a comma between the elements of a date, you know, December 12th, and uh, you do not use a comma if you just have a single word address or just a date, like he arrived from Baltimore in January, then you don't need the comma there. Moving on, these are commas you're probably familiar with. If you're answering a question like yes or no, no, I do not like green eggs and ham, put some commas. If you have some sort of interjection, like an ah, an oh, an e, a woot, you know, you put some commas around it because it's not essential. Um, you also use commas when you're addressing someone specific, like Annie, where'd you get your gun? This comma right here between Annie and where becomes very important. Take a look at this sentence, right? We have, let's eat, Adam, like Adam, come in and eat. Or, let's eat Adam. Things just got really creepy right there, so. Now, you also use commas to contrast or to prevent confusion. Now, these are more stylistic commas. They're not grammatical commas. So you have Harold, not Roy, is my favorite player. So I want to emphasize that, it, that I like Harold, not Roy, so I slow the reader down with some commas. The other one, take a look at this. How many of you just thought I was talking about the Beatles, right, to George Harrison? Well, I'm not. I'm talking about to George, comma, Harrison was a great drummer. So if you have a sentence like this where you're going to end up putting two words together that are going to confuse people, put a comma in between it to separate it just for clarification purposes. Now, there's only a couple more reasons for a comma. The, the next one is coordinate adjectives. You don't run into this too often, but you ever wondered when, whether or not you should put a comma between striped and long-sleeved here? Well, here's the rule. Coordinate adjectives are adjectives that, that are coordinated. They go together, right? They have equal weight in the sentence. So the idea is you can reverse them without impacting the sentence's meaning. 
So how do you spot coordinate adjectives? You flip them. If the sentence means the same thing, then they're coordinate and you need to use a comma. So how can I spot the coordinate adjectives? Well, you can flip them. Does a sentence mean the same thing if they're reversed? If so, they're coordinate. Put a comma in there. Or you can also put an and in between the words. If the sentence still means the same thing, then those are also coordinate and you would use a comma. Let's try this out for a minute. Consider these two sentences. The brick red house was at the end of the street versus the red brick house was at the end of the street. Well, red and, and brick and brick and red are not meaning the same thing. For instance, a brick red house refers to a color. Brick red is a color. This sentence, the red brick house, that refers to a material, like the house is made out of red bricks. So these two are not coordinate. I can't switch them because when I switch them, I change the meaning. So no comma. Take a look at this one right here. We have the laughing excited child played in the yard. The excited laughing child played in the yard. Doesn't matter, I can have them either way, so I put a comma in between because those are coordinate. Now, this is all about comma abuse, when not to use the comma. So, you don't use a comma between the subject and the verb, like the hot and humid weather, comma, made Remy quite ill. No, 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 you don't need a comma there. Um, another abuse of commas, you don't need a comma between an independent and a dependent clause when the dependent clause is at the end of the sentence. That is essentially this comma before because, right? Because and the comma are in a fight. They don't like to be next to each other. Essentially, really, you have to be doing like crazy grammatical gymnastics in order to justify a comma next to a because. So if you have a because in the middle of a sentence, don't put a comma there because they do the same thing. Another abuse of commas is when you end up with a compound subject or a compound predicate. A compound subject is just, it contains more than one thing, like Tom and Nancy went on vacation. Tom and Nancy is your compound subject. Or a predicate is when you have more than one verb, like Sally bought a new dress and got a haircut, bought a new dress and got a haircut. Those are a compound predicate. So you want to make sure that you're not putting commas between these things, like the little boy from my reading class and the tall girl with the red hair. Well. These are both my subject. I don't need a comma here. Or, the animals at the circus perform many tricks and amaze the crowd. Well, I have performing and amazing. There's no need for this comma right here. So, that is comma abuse. Now, moving on, we're going to talk very briefly about semicolons. Semicolons are more than the wink in your smiley face. Bring them back. They have a reason um, more than just, you know, part of your, your emoticon. <laughs> so, you use a semicolon when you're connecting two complete sentences that have closely related ideas. Like, the concert was brilliant, the crowd gave the band a standing ovation. I said I'd do it, I didn't say when I'd do it. So, if you have two ideas that are closely related, you can put a semicolon in between there. That also helps with sentence variety. Or you use a semicolon to separate a series of items if the items are long or if they have commas. Now, I don't know if you guys are Star Wars fans, but the Millennium Falcon blasted out of Mos Eisley with Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Jedi Master, Luke Skywalker, the untried farm boy, Han Solo, the scoundrel, and Chewbacca, the hairy co-pilot. If I had commas in here, then apparently on the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, we have Obi-Wan Kenobi, another Jedi Master. We would have Luke, some other farm kid. We would have Han, another scoundrel, and Chewbacca, and then someone else who's hairy. And that's like way too many people for the Millennium Falcon. It's not that big. So if you have a long list, chunk it up with um, semicolons. In addition to that, you use a semicolon to separate two complete sentences that have a transitional phrase. That's like on the other hand, in fact, or for example. So you put a semicolon before it and a comma after it. That's how you use the semicolon there. And in addition to that, you have uh, use a semicolon to separate two complete sentences that have a conjunctive adverb, which is a really fancy word for like finally, also, hence, however, instead, next, therefore. And it's the same rule as the one we just talked about, where you put a, a semicolon before and a comma after. So. As a, uh, an interesting fact here, William Faulkner, who's a famous American writer, he didn't use commas the right way in his writing, which was really frustrating for readers. And if you want to experience the challenge of understanding something written without conventional punctuation, check out some of his work. But he was an award-winning writer, and until you reach his status, you should use commas and semicolons the way they're meant to be used, especially in academic writing. So just remember, don't use one because you haven't used one in a while, and always ask yourself, if it's necessary.